while some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com and with us today, a new guest, Mike from Rethinking the Dollar. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Elijah, I appreciate you having me as a guest on your show. Looking forward to speaking with you. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss your website, Rethinking the Dollar. Can you explain a little bit about the meaning behind its title? All right. Not a problem. So uh, just to give you an idea, just a little bit about of my background. Uh, back in my former years, I uh, played professional sports. Uh, so I traveled the world a lot. And in doing so, I became somewhat of a uh, currency collector. And so I, you know, I lived down in Argentina and Chile and Uruguay and several countries where I had a chance to actually see firsthand what life was like in those countries. And so I ended up, you know, collecting the currencies just as a little keepsake to bring back home here to America. You know, just something to show my children when they when they got older. And in doing so, I made a lot of friends and uh, throughout the years kept in contact with those friends and, you know, hearing about their struggles and really finding out that their currencies is not really what they were when I was using them myself. And so a lot of people have been uh, kind of rethinking their own currencies locally. So it kind of got me into reading up on the dollar and the Federal Reserve note. And from there, started a whole you know, educational journey where now I'm just uh, trying to tell people that there's more to a dollar than what we were taught in school or what we were not taught in school. So just from my traveling years, I got a chance to see currencies firsthand and then realize that our currency is in a similar position as theirs because it's a fiat-based currency that is backed by nothing and bound to a return to its intrinsic value uh, of zero one of these days. So that's kind of how the Rethinking Dollar message started. So Definitely, and I'd like to get more into that. But first, I'd like to discuss why you think it's so important that people are educated about the monetary system. Well, I, I believe the monetary system and understanding just you know a, a smidget of it will open your eyes to a different reality. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it was years ago, uh, a, a movie called The Matrix. And so I was actually uh, in college during that time frame. And when the movie came out, it was a movie that kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, we're presented with a, a, a fake reality as far as just the day to day life we have here in America. And so that movie kind of opened my eyes up to the fact that there's more to um, every piece of, you know, information that we've learned in school. And then I got to asking myself, I mean, I went from pretty much from preschool all the way to a college degree studying business. And I learned absolutely nothing about money and like actual money, its history, other than just the typical things they share with us in a, in a textbook, which is which is coming to find out now is more watered down than anything else. But yet, you know, I, I learned that our, our monetary system and how money functions in our economy is similar to like, you know, blood to the body. I mean, if, if, if the body has bad blood, and then the whole body itself is sick. And so right now, our monetary system, in my opinion, is not too healthy, being that, you know, people are working, you know, their tails off to save, invest and to, you know, live their lives based upon the idea that, you know, they have a secure future in a piece of paper or, you know, or a digit, but yet know very little about the history of our monetary system, how we've got, how we went from coinage to just mere paper and digits. So the monetary system is by far the, one of the most important things we can learn because right now things are shifting in our world. And so right now is a great time to really brush up on just some of the basics. Because once you begin asking yourself questions about how we've arrived to this point of a, you know, a unpayable debt and just an entitlement mentality here, you'll start to wonder and guess, you know, how long can this last? So that's kind of my thoughts on the monetary system. Definitely. And one of the things that's really crucial to understand is the difference between what we have now as money in the United States, the Federal Reserve note, and the constitutional dollar, which we originally had, which, you know, actually had value and the Federal Reserve note is just paper right now. Can you explain the difference between these two currencies and how we basically went off the gold and silver standard? 
All right, not a problem. Not a problem. So first of all, before I actually explain that, I want to just, you know, uh, on my website, at rethinkingadollar.com, I have a what I consider like a monetary slash IQ test. And so I kind of formulated 10, you know, simple questions um, asking, you know, whoever comes to the site, you know, just to test yourself, see where you're at. And, you know, from there, you'll have a chance to see, you know, what your current level of, 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 of thinking is when it comes to money. And so looking over the results over the last several hundred people have taken a test, the, the overall uh, average from, you know, hundreds of people have taken our test is 20 to 30 percent. That means an overall majority of our population who, you know, stumble across the test or just happen to take it for fun are, are, are failing when it comes to understanding money. And that was just all in regards to the Federal Reserve, not to mention anything prior to the Federal Reserve or, or central banking in general. And so just get back to that question about the Federal Reserve note and the difference between a, that, that and the constitutional dollar. The, the Federal Reserve note, you know, as your audience is aware, I'm sure, is that, you know, it's a it's a, 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 a I would like to say a, a product of a of a system that was designed to fail from its very uh, uh, origins, being that the whole idea of a central bank monopolizing a nation's money supply for its own profit and then returning it back to its citizens is, in my opinion, one of the closest things to uh, flat out theft that there could be. And the fact that, you know, we've lived upon that you know piece of paper now for 100 plus years and you can actually look at the, the, the purchasing power chart of the dollar from the Federal Reserve itself and it just shows a dwindling spiral of lack of purchasing power, but nobody really seems to, you know, for the most part, care or, you know, really question, you know, how low can that, you know, chart go before, you know, you know, all hell breaks loose, you know, part of my French. And so the difference between a Federal Reserve note and a constitutional dollar is simple, that a constitutional dollar in its original sense was founded in our coinage act in 1792. The founding fathers of this country, you know, they, they kind of came up with an idea that the best way to have something stable and consistent was to, you know, coin money and not print money. And so it was, it was clearly stated in the Constitution that, you know, Congress has the right to coin money and to, to stay, you know, stay to stabilize the value thereof and the measures of weights. And it was never intended to be actual piece of paper because they had prior experience with the idea of paper and what it could do. And that was a continental currency, uh, you know, during a Revolutionary War. And so the uh, understanding the difference between Federal Reserve note. And a dollar is, is quite simple. You know, a dollar itself, according to, you know, the, the rethinking a dollar method, it's a fine, it's a defined weight of silver. And a Federal Reserve note is a legalized obligation of our federal, of our government that's owed back to a quasi, you know, semi-private uh, organization. So um, that, that's kind of the difference between the two. And, and one thing I might want to add, it might kind of, you know, stir up a little bit of, of, of conversation is the idea that. You know, rethinking a dollar has a lot to do with a, a, what I would consider a dollar paradigm shift. You know, nations around the world already know that the dollar, quote unquote, the dollar has already expired. And that's why you can kind of tell that from all the activities happening out east with China, Russia, and just the whole rush towards, you know, some form of hedge against, you know, our currency or our world reserve currency at this point. So the dollar itself, in terms of Federal Reserve note, has already expired. And, and this is my statement that I want to kind of make, you know, the dollar at the end of the day is going to be fine. Like a lot of people say monetary collapse. I've had a chance of, of on my show interviewing a lot of people and we use the word dollar in a sense of it being a Federal Reserve note. And I believe the idea of rethinking a dollar is distinguishing between, distinguishing between a Federal Reserve note and a constitutional dollar. And so when I say rethinking a dollar, it's kind of shifting your mind away from the idea of a paper and a digit and focusing more so on an actual measurement of weight. And so and if you were to do that, then the measurement of weight aspect of silver, of course, gold as well, but silver is going to be fine long term. It's not going nowhere. It's been here for, you know, 5,000 plus years. But yet the Federal Reserve note, that's something that I would question because it's only been around for 104 years and counting. But yet, as you see, the purchasing power is dwindling. So it's not much longer before, you know, that thing comes into question amongst, you know, me and you and as well as the citizens here locally. So the dollar is going to be fine long term. But the Federal Reserve note, I have big questions for. If you could talk a little bit more about how the dollar's value has dwindled throughout the years ever since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, I think the dollar has lost, you know, anywhere from 95 to 98 percent of its value. And you're saying, you know, it's not only losing its value, but it's also being rejected all around the world. Can you expand on this? 
Right. Not a problem. And so I, I believe, you know, I, I kind of came to the whole, as I consider it, uh, monetary awareness, you know, kind of right after the whole Great Recession type of thing, because during those years I was, you know, amongst the, as some people say, the sheep or myself, just you know, concerned with my day to day life, you know, of married children, things like that. Wasn't really concerned about, you know, events happening around me. But yet that was my awakening moment where I began to ask questions about, you know, what's going on with our with our monetary system? How come I'm hearing on the TV that we were minutes away from everything shutting down and collapsing and things like that. So that kind of got me started in, in reading and, and doing more research on my own. And in doing so, it really got me to asking, you know, you know, what is a dollar? I mean, I, I, actually, I actually never asked myself what was a dollar or knew anything about what a dollar was by definition. And so in doing that, it really got me to look in into it and then just, you know, typing in, you know, dollar in Google or something like that. There's all types of news articles that come up throughout the years. But yet I want to go back to that graph of our of the as the Federal Reserve says, the consumer, uh, the consumer dollar purchasing power graph, which you did, which you hinted at. And to actually see that graph and to see that over the last hundred plus years, every type of you know, event we've had, whether it be some type of recession or a war or something of that nature has led to a spike in our in our national debt, which has then led to a debasement of our currency because they've, you know, the, not not they, but our, our government has allowed the central bank to, you know, issue more credit slash paper on our behalf. And in, in, in doing so, it's pretty much just, you know, devalue what we currently save and hold. And so every event, I'm looking at a chart right now. Every event from uh, Federal Reserve, uh, FDR, you know, executive order to Bretton Woods to World War One, World War Two, you name it. Every event we've had has just taken a, a hit at the dollar declining more and more and more. And so being that we're now down to two, three percent, that my question is, what will be the next catalyst that can take it, you know, probably negative? I mean, not too many uh, people actually talk about the idea that once the dollar according to this chart, as far as purchasing power reaches zero or perhaps goes negative, that's, you know, that's inflationary. That's hyperinflation type status, you know, similar to the things that's happening right now down in Venezuela. And so just to see that, you know, over the last hundred years, the chart shows that we're losing purchasing power. It hasn't really stirred up any emotion in the public just yet, because most people, you know, are concerned with their day to day lives, not really, you know, thinking long term, realizing that what they're saving and holding on to and trust in it has already, for the most part, failed them. And so the Federal Reserve and the note itself and our debt is going to be the reason why, you know, things shift drastically. And there will be a, a major dollar paradigm shift coming real soon, I believe. So what did the creation of the Fed have to do with the expansion we now see in the national debt? How did the Fed enable the national debt to expand? Now it's at, you know, uh, nearly 20 trillion dollars. All right. Good point. Good question there. Now, I, I believe, you know, in my opinion, the whole idea of a central bank uh, it was was designed to take the shift and the blame and the responsibility off our national off our government as far as being you know fiscally responsible with you know our budget and things like that. If we weren't you know responsible for you know issuing our own currency directly, we could actually you know kind of rely upon someone else and and appear to have to ask for permission to do certain things. As far as, you know, our, us, you know, selling bonds and things like that to, to borrow money from uh, other nations as well as our uh, central banks. And so the Federal Reserve itself has proven to be somewhat of a crutch slash, you know, aid to the, you know, fiscal irresponsibility of our government over the last hundred years. As far as it being able to just, you know, create digits into existence and, and borrow money and monetize debt and things like that. So the Federal Reserve itself has proven to be, I guess, what it was originally designed to do, which was to you know, monetize, privately monetize our national money and then to issue it back to us in the form of debt so that we can then return it back to them through taxation and things like that. Along the way, just debasing our currency through the concept of, of inflation, which, you know, which baffles me at the fact that, you know, it's considered a, a mandate that the Federal Reserve, you know, brags about that it's their responsibility to make sure that they stay at a 2.0 percent or two percent, you know, uh, rate of inflation, which is basically saying that two two percent every year is going to be less purchasing power in our pockets. And so the idea that that, you know, is, is considered, you know, monetary policy is, is absolutely ludicrous to me. But yet that's just how that's just how insane this world is now. And the fact that central banking has pretty much taken over the world and uh, pretty much, you know, enslaved, you know, all of us to their policies and to their, you know, their their way of thinking 
And, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't even really truly elect those people to make decisions on our half, on our behalf, you know, monetarily. So Federal Reserve System itself has been designed as a crutch to support, you know, our government which has allowed us to borrow money, you know, as up, as you mentioned, up close to $20 trillion plus everything else, not including the national debt. But yet it, it's actually made it easier for us to become more of an entitlement based society where now, you know, we're dependent upon the government. You know, everything that most people do has some way or another is tied into receiving some type of aid from the government. So, you know, the Federal Reserve has been a good crutch for us. And uh, eventually that crutch is going to be pulled from underneath us. And then at that point, you know, we'll see who will be there to to, to back our government's, uh, you know, bad fiscal habits uh, in the days ahead. So that's uh, it's going to be interesting to see. That's for sure. I've also heard basically if you use generally accepted accounting principles, the national debt would then also include all the unfunded liabilities, which is about $100 trillion. So what is your perspective on, you know, it seems like, you know, we hear this number $20 trillion all the time, but really the real national debt seems to be over $100 trillion. Right. Good point there. Now, actually, as, as we're speaking right now, I'm actually looking at the U.S. debt clock. And so, you know, when you when you scroll down to the very bottom, it says U.S. unfunded liabilities, according to a gap accounting. And then it kind of lists what's actually included in this number of, of 105 trillion, actually, as of today, according to this uh, website here. But it's, you know, it's Social Security, Medicare parts, A, B and D, federal debt held by the public, federal employee and veteran benefits. So all those, you know, once again, entitlements or promises to uh, the, the public to pay them in the future based upon work, you know, do, did at that particular time when it was initially promised, you know, it, it's it, it's bound to fail for the simple fact that, you know, if we are, you know, spending, we're already living off more than we're able to ever, you know, repay, you know, what would make, you know, someone, you know, in, in rational mind think that our government who's already heavily indebted can actually live up to promises to pay, you know, back, you know, our, our national debt. Nevertheless, you know, 105 and counting trillion dollars. And so the idea that, you know, this, this goes back to the idea of the Federal Reserve being a crutch, the fact that they allowed the, the government to make promises that they knew eventually they couldn't you know, live up to. And that goes back to the, everything happened after the Great Depression with the Social Security you know, uh, Reform Act and, the, and then in the 60s with the uh, Great Society and things like that. Those are all, all designed to, 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 to pacify the current generation at that time, not really taking into account, you know, down the line, someone has to actually pay for that. And as you can, and, and, you know, most people nowadays aren't really working the way they used to work. So it's not enough, you know, money going into the system to actually cover these liabilities. So it's bound to say that, you know, a lot of people pretty soon is going to come up on a short end of the stick. And, that, and at that point, it's going to really come back as a, a rude awakening that they were, you know, for the most part, duped monetarily at the time by politicians, you know, years ago, that's no longer even in office or most people probably couldn't even, you know, go back in time to actually think about the politician that came up with the bill to actually make that promise to them at that time. So it was all part of the whole, whole you know, monetary matrix aspect, you know, putting lids over their eyes just to keep them, you know, quiet at the, in the meantime, not really worry about the reality of it having to be paid off. So it was one of those things where, you know, the government, in order to continue to you know, expand into our lives and everything we do, made some promises that's bound to fail. And just to even hint off that a little bit more, I was talking uh, at, at an interview with Mr. Doug Casey a few inter interviews back on the Rethink Dollar interview series, and he was mentioning how, you know, he kind of feels bad for our generation, being that, you know, his generation was, you know, considered, you know, a great prosperous time where, you know, his family and his mom and dad, you know, had a great, you know, um, uh, lifestyle at that particular time because they were a part of those promises. So they worked hard, they saved and all things like that. But he was saying that I feel bad for your generation being that you guys are going to be the ones that have to foot the bill and you can't even foot the bill. And so and when he said that, it got me to thinking about the idea that, you know, we are susceptible to fall into those same traps of being, you know, promised this and promised that. But yet, you know, no one can actually live up to these promises. So that that's something in and of itself to begin rethinking. The idea that, you know, there's more promises given that can ever be uh, lived up to. So, you know, we're going to be in for a rude awakening, especially the, the millennial and centennial generation, which absolutely know nothing about, you know, monetary, you know, literacy and things like that. So unfunded liabilities will be a problem just because it's, it's more that can ever be repaid, in my opinion. So what does this look like going forward for the, you know, the average person or let's say the millennials? How will this actually impact them? Well, I think it will impact a lot of us in, in different ways, but yet 
are the younger generation, especially the centennials, those that are, you know, born within the last, you know, of the you know, turn of this century, you know, they're the ones that are were going to feel the, the most pain because by the time that they reach their 20s, 30s, you know, they're already they may actually be in a different under a different monetary system in and of itself. And so to, to try to carry those same liabilities into a what might be a new monetary system will, will absolutely cause hardship because, you know, they won't be able to, to really trust politicians to be able to <clears throat> make promises that they will actually be able to even, you know, really expect even in, of them, in, in and of themselves. I'm sorry. And so in the days ahead, you know, the whole paradigm in, in regards to our monetary system will begin to change and actually has already shifted because, as I mentioned earlier, that the world, other nations outside of the U.S. already know that, you know, the monetary system has changed and shifted and that, you know, the Federal Reserve note, a.k.a. the dollar, is already expired. So future generations will feel the brunt of that because they're going to be expected to try to pay some of this back, but won't even have a chance to pay so because, you know, they won't be making much money, you know, to do so. So, you know, taxation won't cover it. So, I mean, how will they be able to cover that? So it's going to be a rude awakening as far as the standard of living, cost of living. For, for us all. So, you know, I feel bad, you know, mostly for us, the centennial generation, because they have no clue what's going on. And we're racking up debt on their head right now as we speak. Now, besides just moving away, you know, we've seen in the past century or so, this move away from gold and silver as money, and now to have, you know, paper as money. What about this new idea of moving to a cashless society? Can you explain a little bit about this? Not a problem. And so, in order to really understand, I believe, a cashless society, as I call it, you know, a cashless uh, initiative, it, it's good to have a, a, a very long term perspective of our monetary system. And so if we were to go back to, you know, the, the kind of the, the beginning of this nation here in dealing with the coinage acts and things like that, it kind of made, you know, coins, actual money of account and units of measurement of wealth to having gone from that to the introduction or reintroduction of, you know, paper currency or, or redeemable paper, you know, when the whole um, civil war happened and the whole greenback thing came in to be, you know, shortly after that the idea of redeeming, you know, paper for coins was kind of put back into place. And then, you know, to rewind that into the, the, into the 20th century where the federal reserve came into play. And then they kind of introduced the federal reserve note, which was one of about five or six other, different forms of money that was used at the time with, you know, gold and silver, they had bank notes, they had, you know, U.S. Treasury notes and things like that. So just to see the evolution of how we went from coins to redeemable paper to solely fiat paper. And then, you know, once the gold standard and the coinage act of 1965 kind of ended the tie with uh, gold and silver coins itself to solely a paperback, it kind of seems like the only thing next to try is to remove the paper even of itself. So to go from gold to paper backed by gold, to nothing but paper, the, the next step, in my opinion, would only be naturally to go, you know, digital to where, you know, right now, most of our money is in the form of uh, digits anyway, when we use our credit card, debit card and things like that. And so the fact that you see other nations around us begin to attack cash and uh, and make cash seem like it's more of a, a, a terrorist you know, thing that's used to hide things and to evade taxation, things like that, which in small cases, I'm sure it is. But yet the idea of removing our personal property has already taken place when gold and silver coins were removed from our, you know, our great, great parents, our great grandparents and us, us giving the bills a receipt in the form of paper. So the next obvious move is going to be to go digital because that seems to be the trend with technology advance. And now we have all these different forms of pain, whether it be, you know, uh, the, the Apple pay and the, the smartwatch pay and so many different ways now of, of transacting, you know, amongst one another in the form of just using smart technology. And so the fact that, you know, the euro 500 euro note a couple of years ago was, you know, removed. And then you have the uh, Indian rupee just recently, you know, they, they removed currency there. And then, you know, former Secretary of Treasury here, Larry Summers, mentioned about removing the hundred dollar bill from circulation. So just the mere fact that they've, they've, they've done it in some countries and they've mentioned it here lets me know what ultimately the plan might be, which is to go digital. So it's only natural. And I think kind of like common sense to think that, you know, if the government continues to grow and to invade into our privacy, as they have shown to, you know, to have done throughout the years, it's only natural that they would want to remove physical cash, which is that last link to kind of just, you know, knowing everything we do on a daily basis. So the cash initiative will eventually come. 
especially as we get further into the year and, and years ahead where the banking system, you know, begins to have problems. And, you know, if, if there's any chance of us, you know, going below zero percent interest rates, which we're currently at now, and, and banks actually starting to charge us, you know, you know, a, a good hefty amount of money to hold our, our accounts there, then it's going to be a real, you know, cramp to crack, crack, crack down on cash because everyone's going to go to cash. So at that point, we can kind of expect some type of law to say, hey, cash is no longer valid and we want it back or something like that. So uh, I think the cash initiative is going to happen. It's just a matter of when. And to take it even one step further, if you actually look at, you know, the Federal Reserve note history itself, they actually started off with like a, a ten thousand uh, dollar bill. They had a, a one thousand dollar bill, five hundred dollar bill. So there's been large denominations of bills which have been removed from the Federal Reserve itself, and they've left us, you know, down to the last, you know, five, which is the hundred, the fifty, twenty five, and some, you know, the two and the, the one. And so removing a hundred and then possibly the fifty, you know, it, it wouldn't be far fetched in my opinion. I mean, they've took a good chunk of their own currency back, so. It's possible it could happen. And, and one thing I like to say kind of jokingly is that if the, if the Fed giveth, the Fed can take it away. So, um, you know, I, it's something I wouldn't put past them being able to do or, or wanting to do one of these days. All right. And before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers some insights about maybe how they can take action, I guess, in their own life and maybe prepare for, you know, further devaluation of the dollar and moving to a cashless society? How can people at least prevent themselves and maybe educate others about how to prepare for this so that they're not hurt as much right good question i believe that the, the best preparation ultimately will be to you know be monetarily aware to have you know firsthand knowledge of our entire monetary system and how it relates to, to present events to be able to you know just not be so concerned with your current reality of you know your daily life of you know getting up working saving things like that but really looking beyond your own personal lifestyles and looking at others looking at other countries and like on my news program I have I cover world events because I believe that everything happening in Venezuela right now or in Zimbabwe or you know anywhere anywhere else where they're struggling I kind of consider those people you know like my my family they're like my brothers and sisters so I'm really concerned with learning about their struggles and seeing how they are, you know, adapting to the harsh realities that they're living. And so I think, you know, preparation starts with education. You know, the more you know, the more you are empowered to take action within your own lives. And then once you begin taking, you know, practical steps, whether it be just, you know, you know, receiving alternative, you know, methods of, of, of storing wealth in the form of, you know, gold, silver, cryptocurrency, things like that, you know, extra can of food in your, in your cupboard or bottle of water and things like that. So just small things add up over time, but it starts with education. And so I, I want to actually hint at a book that I, I've read a long time ago, which kind of helped reshift my, my thinking and kind of gave me that different dollar paradigm perspective. It's a book uh, called Paradigms uh, by Joe uh, Baker, and it's about you know, being able to, to predict the future. And actually, the subtitle is The Business of Discovering the Future. And in his book, he talks about you know, the paradigm and how paradigms shift, what a paradigm is, and, and really you know, beginning to look at your entire world from a different perspective. And he used several examples about how, you know, paradigms shift whenever problems are discovered. And, and right now our country, you know, is, is facing a major problem, not only with this debt, but just the, the political structure of our country. So there's already, you know, trends that are forming, which are presenting problems. And so the paradigm in, in surrounding all that has already shifted, as I hinted at earlier. Other nations around us already know that the United States of America is in turmoil. So it's just a matter of time before either we cause a complete meltdown of our in our own in our own actions or something outside of us is done. And so education in regards to you know thinking differently and, and renewing our minds in regards to what's going on around us, it will really play a big difference down the line outside of the physical things of you know things I mentioned earlier as far as the natural pe preparation. So getting an education would definitely go a long way, as well as watching shows such as yourself. And where you do a good job of educating and informing people, keeping people up to date. So things like that, alternative, alternative means outside of status quo will definitely help people go you know, down a long time. And then also for, for younger kids, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the centennials, they're the ones that are at the greatest risk of a complete, you know, just a rude awakening because they they're growing into a digital age where all they know is digital transactions. And so, you know, I have I have children myself and, and, and just recently to try to 
reach out to those that don't have a chance to watch shows like that, like this, or, or people who are not interested in, sh- in things of this nature. I-, I wanted to find a way to try to, you know, get at them and to let them know that, you know, you're working hard for something that technically doesn't even belong to you. So you are in need of a true monetary awakening. And so I kind of uh, pinned a, a couple of ideas in the form of what I consider a dollarcation. And so actually I, I came together with all these different historical events and put it in a in an infographic and I actually made it for my son. But yet I realized that majority of people, even adults, people that in my circle don't really know these things. So that's something I kind of made available and just actually put on my website not long ago. But yet it's designed to be a, 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 a starting step or a piece of, or a tool to help people begin asking questions. And the, the biggest question they probably going to be able to ask one of these days is, you know, what is a dollar? So that's kind of my, my thoughts there. But uh, other than that, education, I believe, is, is the first step. And then everything else will follow from there. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Yeah, sure. Elijah, I, I appreciate you taking time to sit down uh, and, and speak with me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I I've, uh, I thank you for you with the work you do. I've learned a lot from your videos uh, throughout the years. And then if you want to find out more about the Rethinking a Dollar concept, you can just go to RethinkingADollar.com. And, uh, you know, get, get a chance to, to actually take that money IQ test I, I, uh, I mentioned earlier. And then from there, I wrote an ebook that uh, is doing quite well. And then also the dollarcation link. If you just hashtag dollarcation into your social media site, something will pop up that will take you towards uh, this infographic I was talking about. And other than that, I do the YouTube channel as well, RethinkingTheDollar.com. So other than that, you know, that's where you can find me at. And just I share as much information as I can on this subject, which I believe is one of the most important subjects we, you know, are facing right now. So. Uh, that's uh, Rethinking a Dollar. Once again, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.